school. Um, I speak to him about a book that he's uh, published, um, which I, I believe your teacher will have spoken to you about. It is available for you to purchase. Um, so this is Michael Kuehl. Michael Kuehl is an author. Um, could you just give us a bit of an idea of what the kind of theme is of the book before I read a, a section from it? Yeah, i um, sure most of you probably either read or seen Game of Thrones. If you have, it's better than that. Uh, no, it, it's medieval fantasy. It's uh, all my own world that I've created. Um, sword fighting, kings, romance, kind of ticks all the boxes, really. Uh, it's the start of a, a saga. So, yeah, it's kind of self-explanatory, really. Lovely. So I'm going to read a, a section from the book to kind of set the scene for you so you know um, what, the, what the story is about, how the story is framed. Um, and then Michael's going to come back and talk a bit more about how we got into the writing process and, and how it's all gone from there. So this section of the book that I'm about to read is introducing two of the key characters that you will be looking at in the story. Um, so, bear with me. The deer stood silent, enjoying its relaxing surroundings during its search for its next meal. It had strayed far from its home, deep into the heart of the woods, seeking the next tasty treat to tantalise its taste buds. The deer did not understand the troubles of men, and nor did it care. In its own mind, it had no owner, no restrictions, no ties holding it back. It was as free as the wind, a creature of its own devices. All it cared for was its own survival, and at this moment that involved locating its next meal. So that was what it was doing, pottering its way around the woods, scavenging for whatever it could find. The deer had very few expectations for the day ahead, but one thing it had planned was that by nightfall it would sleep so that it could rise another day. However, as the arrow struck its body, piercing its skin with a force that knocked it off its feet, those small expectations quickly began to slip away. The deer was still breathing with a struggle as Garrett Downwood of Havendale emerged from the green undergrowth into the clearing where the deer lay. Garrett was an agile man, his muscles supple on his slender frame. Thick black hair framed his clean shaven face. His upper body was covered by a brown linen shirt and a battered green leather doublet over the top. His athletic legs were adorned by leathers that had seen better days. An ancient sword hung at his waist, while in his hands a longbow made of yew wood sat proudly. A quiver of leather and animal fur hung across his back, boasting a collection of arrows matching the one which now nestled in the deer. Garrett knelt down beside his dying prey resting one hand on its ribcage in a moment of silence. The damn thing isn't even dead. That is five points and nothing more. The booming voice that broke the silence belonged to Bromon downwards with Havendale, elder blood brother to Garrett. Bromon was twice the man of Garrett in appearance. Unlike Garrett, Bromon's muscle was thick and there for all to see. His arms were like branches, his legs like tree trunks. Cloth trousers clung to his thighs while a leather jerkin strayed across his chest. His boots were wolfskin, while he had bare skin draped across his shoulders, both earned by the result of his own devastating hands. A mighty backlance was knocking against his leg as he forced shrubbery, shrubbery aside and joined his brother, moving over him in the same way he had done ever since childhood. The shot was perfect, I would like to see you do better. Garrett replied with defiance, pleased with his efforts. He knew that when it came to the use of a bow, Bromon could not even come close to him. Perfect? Then why does it still breathe? Bromon let out a large belt of laughter at the failing of his younger blood sibling. Bromon was right, and Garrett hated that. There was nothing subtle about Bromon, from his appearance to his attitude, and especially when it came to gloating. He knew he wouldn't hear the end of this all day. As he took hold of the arrow, he tugged hard, pulling it from the torso of the deer and causing the blood flow to pick up pace. Still, the deer breathed, and he knew what must be done. As he always did with his kills, he made a silent apology in his mind while gripping the arrow firmly in his hand, ready to drive it through the throat of the deer to end its agony once and for all. Forgive my actions, and may the gods be gracious as you embark on your afterlife. An opening to what we will learn about from the book. So I'm going to hand over to you, Michael, and you can speak a little bit about uh, the story and your process as a writer. Okay. Well, so it's quite interesting. It's the first time I've actually heard someone read it to me, so it's quite interesting to for myself to hear it back. 
So why am I here? Um, obviously it's World Book Day. Uh, I'm a local author. I'm self-published local author. And I think I'm well aware, obviously from my days, it can get a bit boring listening to someone droning on and on for a while, but I try to make it as interesting as I possibly can. If there's any questions, I'll answer them. Um, but for me, if we, if we can get anything out of today, then that would be for you to go away. And if any of you have got any ideas, aspirations, want to be able to do, whether it's writing a book, other some creative, that you can do it. Okay, I'm just a normal guy, some average guy. I've managed to write a book. It is possible for any of you if you have the desire and you put your mind to it. So I mean, it, it probably started I, when I was a kid. Uh, I was a ma massive book fan. Used to read all the time. Um, as I've grown up, I've always had quite a creative mind. So I've done different bits and pieces through the years, bits, little bits of creative writing, silly stuff really, um, but it's probably kind of kept my mind active. And then probably about eight years ago, I was at work, bored, and decided, you know what, I want to do something. I was about to say that I have achieved something all on my own. Um, I want to write a book. So once I had that idea, I thought, God, where do I begin? Now, I've got to say, why I chose medieval is probably a bit of laziness, in a sense. Because for me, if I was going to write about, I don't know, a, a guy named Dave who lives in Strood, who is a, is a racing driver, for example, I'd need to research the road he lives on, the history of it, the streets he goes by, the shops, all that kind of thing. I have to research all about racing driving. So much stuff that, to be honest, I don't have the time for. And I'll be honest, I'm would struggle with, you know, as I say, it's a bit lazy. So for me, I chose medieval because I could create my own world, which then counteracts the laziness because by doing that, I've had to come up with everything. So from the, the almost like a map of the land, the cities, the little villages, people, names, um, the history of it, um, which is stuff that I've built as I've written it. It's impossible. I mean, I know some people will sit down and love to plan everything beforehand. That personally isn't me. I've come up with ideas and then I've built as I go. Um, I've tried to keep it fluid so that things can change, things can be tweaked, things can be improved um, as and when they need to be. So I had the idea. The question was then, I think got a piece to put together. So when I first started, The Lost King, I, the name of the title kind of came to me straight away really. Um, Kind of, well, I don't want to really give the storyline away as to why, but basically, uh, the main character in it, Arendelle, uh, he should be heir to the throne. Uh, events happen at the beginning of the book where basically he loses his memory, he's, he's nowhere, he isn't even aware of his entitlement, basically. Um, and as the story progresses, it, he moves forward. I, I say, I don't really want to give the book away in case anyone who reads it, but um, he goes on his journey. Starts to find out his roots and starts tackling all the difficulties that have emerged in the land. Um, so technically, he is the lost king. So I had the, the title idea, and I knew originally that I wanted it to be a trilogy, uh, probably based off the fact of most good film series of trilogies. Um, so in my head, I thought, oh, I'll do a trilogy. That'd be great. Um, and then I kind of sat down and I, was, I knew very quickly how I wanted the first chapter of the very first book to start. And I formed how I wanted the last chapter of the book, the first book, and the very ending of the whole series. And the rest of it, I kind of had them to piece together. And that I did, I sat down, this is all at work by the way, <laughs> it was a bit, um, working full time as well, but I sat down and started planning out chapters. Didn't, didn't set myself a chapter target. Um, if you speak to other authors, people go on about word limits and stuff. I, I never even thought about that, to be honest with you. Uh, I just sat down and thought, how do I get from A to B in the best way possible? Sat down, wrote out basic chapter ideas. I think originally it was about 36 chapters. Um, and once I had that in place, started writing chapter one. Now, I'd like to say I did all this really quickly. Uh, that book took me six years to write, which is a long time. Um, but then, as I say, I'm... I work full time, got family, obviously there's natural things in life as well. So trying to write on the side, and I'll be honest with you, I probably didn't believe in myself. I started writing it, and then as I'm writing it, I'm thinking, 
you know, God, am I actually really going to do this? I'm actually going to write a book, you know, and we're going to do 36 chapters. And for a while, I probably didn't think I'd ever finish it. So I'd write a bit, leave it, go back to it again. And then kind of one day I kind of thought, well, do you know what? Work frustrating. I really want to get this book done. And so I actually sat down, focused on it, and probably wrote the second half of the book in six months. So I spent five years writing one half, six months writing another. But for me, I think it shows in the book. I know people who've read it, and I, I personally know from looking through it myself. You read the first couple of chapters, and I think the quality of them compared to as you go further forward, and I've got more experience at writing and, and thinking about it, I think it, you can notice a difference. And it has been said to me that perhaps the first couple of chapters are a bit weaker compared to how it goes along. And that is all just learning. You know, I'm kind of self-taught in it. I've not had any guidance on how to write a book, what to do. I'm, just from reading myself over the years and um, you know so I've learned as I go along in that process and I've changed it as well you know never be afraid to change things I as I, I had a break from it and I reread through the plans and thought my god this is really boring of <laughs> some of it the start, I think the second half of it I, I probably spread out too much 36 chapters was too many um, and I was just waffling probably like now for the sake of waffling you know so I had to sit down and change it. So I, I rewrote all the plans. And I've done that four times, I think, chapter plans. Twice because I'd lost the previous plans. Because if you're going to do it right in a book, never write on a piece of paper, which is what I did. And then you lose the piece of paper. But whenever I've rewritten it, I think it's always ended up working out for the better. Because each time I've rewritten it, I've learned a little. I've had more experiences, more inspiration from other areas. Which has then helped me improve the chapters. And I have to say, one of the reasons why I personally wrote a book, I'm a massive geek, I'm not afraid to say it, and I love films, love books, but the amount of times I get frustrated with how a film ends or how the arc of a character goes, where it's great to a point and they do something, I'm like, oh, God, why have you done that? So I wanted to be in control, effectively. I wanted to be able to do my own story, run the characters how I wanted to do them, and know that they they finish how I would want them to finish, to have that control. So, hence, I wrote the book. Um, so, yeah, say so that took six years. Once, I so say, yeah, yeah, you'll have ups and downs, you'll you have doubts. People do it different ways. I know a lot of people, I I've, I've talked to different authors <coughs> on social media and stuff like that, and I know a lot of people will write a chapter, and they'll go back, and they'll change it. And they'll change it again. And they start doubting whether what they change is good. And they'll change it again. Um, someone, my wife Caroline, the back knows. He, he wrote his whole book. And pretty much went back and changed the whole thing. For me personally, never do that. I kind of feel that what you, when you actually come to writing it, what you've originally written is what you truly want to say. That is the story you want to tell. And when you go back and change it, you're kind of getting paranoid. Well, do people like this? I should have tweaked it. You take it, you start taking it away from what you wanted, and then you get unhappy with what you've got. So you just keep changing it and changing it. So for me, when I wrote a chapter, I go back to proofread it, and I leave it. What I do, as I say, is when I realise um, perhaps I think some of my plans ahead aren't, aren't good enough, or I start writing like with the second book I'm writing at the moment, it gets a bit more complicated, and I start to realise that how it's supposed to go, my plans ahead don't fit. I will stop where I am and I won't start again until I'm happy that I've pieced together everything properly. So that's where I change it. I don't go back, I kind of change going forward. Um, so it's written, then it's about getting published. Now, pub getting published is very, very difficult. I personally am self-published. Um, I know otherwise a lot of people, you've got to send your manuscript off, find different publishing companies, uh, and then you send your manuscript to them. They go through it with a fine tooth comb, probably pick it apart. Don't personally, I don't know if I can handle someone going through it and coming back and telling me it's rubbish, it's this, that, and the other. Um, but it's a massively long, long progress. I mean, JK Rowling, for all her success now, she sent the, uh, Harry, the Philosopher's Stone off to eight different publishers that rejected it. And there's a ninth publisher whose daughter picked up the script, read it, and said, I think you need to publish this. This would be great. That's why I got picked. 
So the Harry Potter series might never have been because of eight different publishers rejected it. Look at the success it has now. So this gives you an example of how hard it can be. So I went down the self-publishing route because I wanted a physical copy of the book. I wanted to be able to hold it up and say, I've actually written this and other people can read it too. Uh, now I've, I've been lucky because someone my parents grew up with, he's worked in books all his life. Uh, his name's Ian, Ian Hughes. And he always did book cover designs. He's done them for Stephen King, Jeffrey Archer for the years. And then when ebooks started to come about and kind of revolutionized so I was reading to a degree, he realized that the demand for book covers would be less. Um, and he started branching into kind of helping people get ebooks published. He would format them, etc. So I contacted him and he still does it. So cover design, I had my ideas in my head how I wanted it, probably far too extravagant because it's completely not what I originally thought. But he's got his process, he's got the experience of, on how to do it. Um, so we, we, we moved ideas backwards and forwards until we came to, oh, I suppose you can see it there, the one that we've got. Now, I hadn't even thought about doing a set of covers for all the books that kind of tie into the series, because my mind, I wasn't thinking about that, I was just thinking about writing. But I now have covers for all of the books, and they're all off the same theme, just the weapons change, the logo on the, sh the shield will change, and the colour will change, but the same idea, so for collectors, people who want to actually collect the series, that you'll see, was, again, with the Harry Potters and stuff, they re-release them with different covers, because people love to collect a set. And I'd never even thought about that, it wasn't until Ian told me. So we worked out a cover, and then I sent him the man my manuscript, We'd had it, I'd had it proofread, because you must get it proofread, it must be 100%. And we had a friend do it originally, he was, we thought he was pretty good at English. Went through it, I made the changes he suggested, sent it to Ian. And while he, I didn't get a phone call one day from him while he's trying to format it. He was formatting it for producing as a book like that and as an e-book. And the phone call I got basically said, I scanned the first two pages and you've got so many mistakes, I dread to see the rest of it. And, well, I could have sworn down the phone, in all fairness, because it's the last thing you want to hear. And it turns out for me, while I can write a book, I'm not actually that great at writing, or that at least then I wasn't, because punctuation errors, I never really knew what to put where, where, where the best places were for paragraphing. Uh, I always used to think, when should, should I put a capital letter for stuff? Because, like, for example, if you, for me, I always put a capital letter for king, because it's a role. There's actually there's two forms of when you, whether you use a lowercase or a capital. So there's little bits and pieces that, I didn't realise, and thankfully his wife is an English teacher, and she proofread it for me, and um, my god did she change a lot. And it was a real eye-opener for me, because it was probably the first knock off the pedestal since, because I was writing on the hive, oh, I've written a book, and then it's actually, god my writing's terrible. Not the creative side of it, but, you know, say that the punctuation and, and that, it just, it was a real eye-opener, so it is high, it is very, very important that if you ever decide to write a book, get someone decent to proofread it. Someone, there are people out there, you can hire people, they do charge per page normally, but there are people out there who will do it, who that is their job. And again, Ian explained to me how you could write the best book in the world, but if someone picks it up, and then in the first couple of chapters, there's 50 spelling mistakes, and the grammar's all over the place, they'll put it down. It will you'll get slated, because while it's a great story, they're looking, it looks so amateurish, it looks terrible. They're looking, no, I can't, I can't read that. And then once you get a bad review, you said, you know, you can have 400 good reviews, one bad review can kill a book. So I was like, God. So I had to have it, so proofread again, which is a bit of a process. Thankfully, she did a great job, and now I have the book. But I've been lucky, I still had to pay, I've had to pay for everything myself. So I had to pay for the cover design, I had to pay for the proofreading, uh, I've had to pay for, I had 200 copies of the book made, optimistically, I'd imagine, because I didn't expect to sell more than two, and one of those was to my mum. So I've sold now about 115 paperbacks, I think, um, and then it got put as an ebook on Amazon, and I've probably had about 50 downloads on that. Um, 
but self-publishing is, is not easy. I mean, there's a table here of stuff, it's kind of random stuff, but it's available to buy, but we also did it, I think it's a good example to show, like, you've really got to try and put yourself out there, but you've got to pay for it all, and hope that you get the return for it. So everything on the table I've had I've had to pay for. Um, I've done advertising on. I use Instagram a lot. Um, I did do Twitter, but I find Instagram is a better form. I've got a site on Facebook. I've done all for live talks. Um, I've had like a trailer video, a book trailer video done. Um, I've done all sorts. I do. You do promotional days, and you come up with bank holidays. Still like bank holiday promotional day. The ebook's ninety nine p or whatever. And then you go and check the sales at the end of the day and you got one. And you think, God, I've just done... You know, it, it is hard to push it into sales. But don't let it put you off. At the end of the day, if you're sitting there and you've got that book, you've done that, you've achieved that yourself. Um, you can't... No one ever can take that away from you. You know, and then it, it takes time. A lot of people say it's normally once the second book comes out or there's a series, that's when it... Well, at least I hope... That's when it kicks in um, and it starts to move things on. But it, so it is tough. I'm not here to sit there and go, well, it's really tough, don't do it. Still do it. If you want to do it, whether it's a book or whatever you want to do, don't get put off by it. Keep keep going at it. Because at the end of the day, whether it is a massive success or not, you still achieve that. And there's a lot of people who won't have. And you can always be proud of what you've achieved. I also have to say I had to do it I'm a uh, part-time, uh, I've got a full-time job, um, through doing my, my book, I now do, um, I'm not almost like a writer and editor for, uh, for, for, for a football fan site, but it's able to create the stuff that I've done, so it keeps my mind ticking over, it keeps me typing, um, so trying to fit it in is difficult, I mean, I, I started the book too, and I set myself out a plan of two years from starting it to publishing it, and just over a year in, I'm just short halfway through the book. Because I've had, to, I've, again, I've had to fit it in with time. I've made changes to it. Um, I also realised when I was writing it for ages, something was nagging me. I just thought I couldn't get, quite get into it. And I realised that running off the idea of a trilogy, because film trilogies are great, wasn't working for the book. I was condensing it down too much that you'd lose the story. So it's now four books. So I'll give myself an extra book to write. But I think in the, in the long run, it will be more beneficial for the story. So I've had to make that change. And the second one's more complicated. But why I never thought of with the first book. So I spent so much time thinking, will I even bother Will I even get it finished? That's all I ever thought about. With the second book, because there are some people who have read it, and they're actually like, I really enjoyed this, really enjoyed the characters, love where it's going, I can't wait for the second one. There's now some expectation. And whether that expectation is for two people... Or two million people, it's expectation. So I'm writing it thinking, God, I hope I don't ruin what everyone loved from the first one. So it is being a bit of a slower process, but it will happen. And, and that's what, you know, there are people who try them out in like, four books out in a year. I don't know how to do it. Um, and I suppose if you've got a publisher, there'd be a demand, you must get this done now. You must. I haven't got that being self published. And at the moment, I wouldn't. Unless I, I could do it full time, I wouldn't be able to fulfil that. So I've got control over it, which is a bonus. It's one of the perks of being self-published. Another is you've got control over everything. So if I want to do a poster a certain way, if I want to do an advert a certain way, if I want to come do talks like this, I've got control over that. Whereas the publisher would probably own the rights to the book, and I don't want someone to. So, so it's not not easy, but there's a book sitting there, so it's doable. It is achievable if you put your mind to it and you work hard at it. <sighs> because I'm just waff because it's just me talking at the moment. I'm well aware. I think there was asleep. It's understandable. <laughs> I know what it's like. If people sit there and talk at me all the time, I'm like, I'll start drifting off. It's how my mind goes. So, has anyone got any questions that they'd actually like to know an answer to before I carry on? You certainly can. Um, and how do you literally 
go from idea to word on page. So I know what my idea is, I've got characters, I've got kind of storyline that, that goes quite a long way, but then I sit down and think, I, literally, I don't know where to start with the, with the actual story of the words on the page. I mean, is that taking a long time? Do you have, or is it just, it just flowed instantly? Uh, I suppose it kind of just flowed, it just, I suppose it's just how my mind works. Um, I say the one thing I knew concrete was that first chapter, um, which in this is Arendelle's a ten-year-old boy tied to a tree um, and basically expected to die, and I knew that's how it was going to start. So I suppose give me that starting point, got the first chapter out of the way, um, and I, I kind of, as I say, I do a, a basic plan of a chapter, and then I sit down and I just start typing, and I, it, the ideas flow and you can. Start piecing it together as you go along. I think you just kind of need to, the daunting thing is to actually sit down and go, right, I'm going to start writing now. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes you just have to do it, see where it goes. Just sit down one day and just, if you ever want to write anything, sit down one day, just start typing. Have you ever written a bit, a section, got to the end of that section, which is what that's like, right, and just completely got rid of it and started again? Or is it all been stuff that you've worked with and adapted? And no, I've never got to, got, got to a bit and delete the whole lot. Um, there are some chapters that are really gutsy. I know when I read a book, um, some chapters I think, God, this chapter's boring. And you kind of, but you need to get through that chapter because it's got this important side to it to get to the good bits. But you think, oh, God, this is terrible. And writing it as well, I know there's some chapters which are much tougher to write, uh, whether it's scene changes or it's just a bit of a... A dreary section compared to the good stuff. Um, I mean, writing a battle, I can now see why George Martin avoids it so much in all the Game of Thrones books. Because writing a battle is really, really difficult. Um, because there's so much going on. If you think a battle of hundreds of people, so I, I kind of focus it from one viewpoint. But even then, there's stuff happening everywhere. Trying to write it, write so much going on and not repeat yourself all the time is very, very difficult. So I've probably stopped. I don't, I don't really go back and delete it, but I've, I've stopped before I, I probably, if I carried on at that point, I probably would like write a load of, of gold. You kind of have to have a break and reset your mind a little bit. So, yeah. Um, one thing I would say, characters, uh, I say for those who ever do want to write anything, where you get inspiration for characters from? Well, you're in a room full of people. Inspiration's all around you. You've got your mates, your family. I do it. So, some of my characters are based off of, whether it's just the name. I mean, mine's got completely random names in it. But whether it's the name, um, how they look, how they act. Um, I use people that I know for inspiration for that. One of the main bad guys in this, who Marquesian, who is supposed to be like this basic killing machine, is based off one of my best mates because he's the complete opposite to that. Um, he is definitely not a <laughs> complete killing machine. Uh, so I, I did that purposely just to annoy him. But it worked perfectly as a character. Um, I've got a whole series of characters in there called Seekers who didn't exist when I originally planned the book. Uh, but I, in my full-time job, I do a lot of searching as one of my skills. And someone I was on my, must be my search team one day, and so I was like, oh, we should put a team in it as a joke. And I took that as a challenge and created, uh, say, a tribe called the Seekers, loosely based off of the team. And that ended up leading to a main character who now runs throughout the book. So uh, it, by doing that, by taking that gamble, actually enhanced, in my opinion anyway, it's enhanced the story by creating another key character. So I always use different people. Also looks, I mean, Arendelle, the lead character, for me, was inspired by... Um, Chris Hemsworth is four. In my head, that is how he looks. Um, Fate of King Fagrin, who's the main bad guy in it, in my head I was thinking um, Prince John in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Um, you know, that is, I think sometimes if, if you can form that picture in your head, it makes you easier to write about someone, to write for that character, because you can picture them. And then it's all about going out there and putting enough detail and description in so that the reader can then picture them. 
Um, oh, I've done it, but I, I used to read a book, and in my head I'd form an idea of how a character looks. And I remember I didn't watch the film, and I'd be like, but that's nothing I can. And it'd almost be disappointed. Sometimes it's better, or it'd be disappointed because that's not how I, in my head, had created that person to look. Um, and I think, likewise, if you watch a film, and you really like the film, I think sometimes you can read the book, and how they describe them, you think, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not how the person is in the, in, in the film. So I, I've done Harry Potter backwards, I've watched the films, I've never read the books, and now listening to them on audio, and it's so different. So, it is about picturing, you know, picturing them in your head first, and then using enough detail so that the reader can picture them. Because if the reader can picture them, they're going to enjoy that story a hell of a lot more. Would I be able to introduce you Someone's got a beer, I suppose. Yeah, it's me. I'm <laughs> um, and it's, it, it's really interesting because I, I, I always preferred it that way because then when I was reading the books, I could just picture it the way that the film had done this. But then I thought, well, you know, what, what would my own imagination have done? If I'd done the books first, how would my own imagination have seen that character instead of relying on how it was done in the film? So the character description element is a massive, massive part of it. Um, which you heard two of the characters being introduced there and how you got to know about their physical appearance and what to do with the relationship with the brothers. Which is kind of a, probably about realising a perfect example for the competition because mm -hmm. it shows a bit of that introduction to them, um, how they were described. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, I've, I've, I've written some stuff and I've realised that they're just words that I've made up, I think, over time. But if somehow in my head I thought, oh, that's, that's how you describe something, and I've just totally made it up. But, um, you know, yeah, it's just it's looking for that like, creative idea. I mean, if people come back with a character named Gary Johnson, that's just not going to do it. <laughs> but, I, I mean, I've just made up, the names I use are most random, made-up things. But then if you see Game of Thrones, they're all the same. It's that making it different, making it stand out, and just be creative with it, have a bit of fun with it. And, you know, as I, I, mean, I, I like the idea, personally, of being able to put one into the, into the book. Because I've, I've, the whole way through, I, I am open to ideas and suggestions. I mean, my dad read the first book and asked me about a, a weapon in it and will we see it again. I hadn't even thought about it. It hadn't even crossed my mind. But the point he raised about it was actually quite valid and it got me thinking. And I've actually come up with an idea down the line where it will actually come back. Um, and I've had other people suggest stuff. And I'll always take stuff on board because... End of the day, if you want, if other you want other people to read it and enjoy it, well then they're going to have ideas and suggestions, like I would do when I watch something. I will go to the cinema, I will count going, that was great, but I really would have done this bit differently. We all do it. We'll we'll criticise different things in different ways, 
And actually, sometimes we've all got a valid point. So I like being open about that. I like being, having the option to put different ideas in. So if someone comes up with a really good character, I'd be happy to put it in. And they, you know, we're not just talking like they'll make a one-off appearance in, in a bar or something. It could end up being someone that runs two, three books if the character's good. So definitely give it the best shot and I should look forward to reading them. Uh, has anyone else got any questions? They might ask about any of it, process, anything. No. Well, I'm not the guru. I'm not the mid front of all knowledge when it comes to writing a book. I can only talk about my experiences. Uh, and I've, I've learned from talking to others. I, I do things pretty very differently to a lot of other people. Um, but as I said at the start, in the, the day, don't doubt yourselves. If you want to do something and say whether it's writing a book, whether it's becoming a filmmaker, whether it's sports or art or anything, if, you, if there's something that you really, really, really want to do, do it. Don't let other people tell you you can't. Don't let people put you off. Don't let life distract you. And it, and it does. I get distracted. You know, it's hard to sit down and write a chapter when there's something really good on that I want to watch. That's natural. Um, my daughter's jumping all over me. You know, you just. This stuff happens in life and it will get in the way. But if you really want to achieve something, you'll find a time and you'll be able to do it. And yes, it may not work straight away, but just keep going. Just keep giving it your best shot. Keep trying and you will achieve it. And at the end of the day, whether what you achieve is a great success or a small success, you've achieved it, you've done it. So it, for you, it will always be a success. Um, there are books available to buy here today. Um, I realise that I've got my money in my pocket, so I'm going to have to move and get my present. Uh, it's dish tablets today, so at the moment it's it's probably still sound a lot, but it's, it's seven pound for a book, or you can get two for a tenner. Um, I'm sitting here with a bit of an idea because you think about Game of Thrones a lot on the back of that. That's also a very similar theme. Um, guess what day is coming up? Mm -hmm. Mother's Day. If anybody has a mother's interest in Game of Thrones, maybe she might like the book. Um, perhaps, maybe you might like the books, but you are interested in the courage of stories that come through in Game of Thrones. Um, so, if you don't have any money on you today, if you don't have any stories with you, um, you did say it's available on Amazon. Yep. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, it would be at the full price of Amazon market with the discount today. Um, but there are opportunities to purchase it. You know, if any of you have got the money, you enjoy yourself to get the phones. And it's not that they come up, you just don't know what to get. Maybe that might be a nice idea. What, what I've said with Mrs. Cobb was that if people want one and don't have the money, then if they just basically put the name down, I can leave the, I'll leave copies of the book and then they can buy it from. Uh, oh. Just one thing I want to add because I, I did hear uh, God, seven pound. I know it sounds a lot. If you go to Waterstones, you'd be paying more than that for most books. One thing I say, that's one of the things of being self-published. I've had to pay for that book to be pub to be made. So for 200 copies, it ended up working out. That book alone is probably about two pound ninety. On Amazon, they take a percentage. So they will put on because you have to buy the book, and they will put on um, post packaging. They work it out and they put it on themselves. However, they then take a percentage of the sale. So say at the moment that's on for eight ninety nine, and then the postage on top. I will actually get less than what the original price is because they will they will someone will pay say then ten pound twenty because of the postage. By the time Amazon have taken their percentage, I've then got to pay for the postage myself, which is for the weight of that about two pound ninety. So from that ten pound say, I will end up getting six twenty. If you then remove from that the fact that the book costs only three pound to produce, I make three pound out of it. For the ebooks at the moment, it's even less. The ebooks are available for one ninety nine at the moment, and they take a percentage out of that. So that is, and it's the same as you went to an actual publisher; they'll take a cut. So that you know, they they might say the agreement is we make forty percent of your sales, we take forty percent. So that is why I'd love to be able to turn and say, yeah, two quid, buy it for two quid. Just not practical in any way, shape, or form. That is sadly how it goes. But it's, 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 I think it's worth it. And other people have said it's worth it. And 14 out of 15 reviewers on Amazon say it's worth it. The other guy just says it's average. So we don't like it. But uh, 
yeah, as I say, it's hopefully, I know it's just probably been a bit boring listening to me waffling on, but if from from today you take out of it a bit of inspiration that you can do it, that's great. If you take out of it a copy of a book, it's even greater. Thank you. Thank you. Right, can we have a, can I have a couple of minutes? Can I have a look at any of the, the merchandise?